Episode 25, the 18th of October, 1998. The plants still in pots are dying to get their feet in the soil, but most of their homes are not fully prepared yet, but we're almost there. I can start to believe, only on a very good day, that the garden will be finished this year. Not that any garden is ever really finished, but you know what I mean. James Van Sweden has left his mark in the front garden as planned. The palette of plants used in the gardens that he designs with Wolfgang Irma is very small, since they are required to perform for a very long season with a very simple maintenance regime. Irma is the plantsman in the team, constantly trying out new species and varieties. Anything to which he gives space in a garden for the rest of us is worth looking at twice. But for very keen gardeners, there is no need to limit the plant selection to those which thrive with such minimal care, or at least that last indefinitely in a garden situation. I'm happy to use frost tender plants, for instance, that might require replacing every year, or very vigorous plants that will require constant reduction and discipline. I wouldn't put them in anyone else's garden, but I'm content to use them in my own. Excuse the dog, I don't know what's going on out there. She's barking at something and just will not stop. It's necessary for the style, however, that the diversity of plants be sufficiently small that the effect is a simple one with broad interlocking sweeps of just a few species. Grasses are almost always present and mostly dominant. In 1989, when Van Sweden himself came to lecture at the Garden Design Conference in Melbourne, the miscanthus species that they rely on heavily were hardly known here. We now have such a good range available that it's difficult to choose between them. Wanting the drama of maximum height in one season, I couldn't look past Miscanthus sacrifloris. Actually, that has since been renamed, or no, it's been re-identified as Miscanthus sinensis giganteus, not what we all thought at the time, Miscanthus sacrifloris. But I'll start that again. Wanting the drama of maximum height in one season, I couldn't look past Miscanthus sacrifloris, which can comfortably reach three metres by the end of summer. When flowering, it's even taller, but it's possible that in my cool climate and without full sun, it won't get to flowering before the onset of winter finishes it off. I don't care that much, for the foliage bulk is largely what I'm after. All the other cultivars are somewhat smaller, though many can still get to two metres each season. Miscanthus sinensis, sinensis silverfeta will do so easily though it grow, its growth form tends towards producing a plant of rounded outline once established. Most cultivars of Miscanthus sinensis do likewise without the emphatical vertical statement given by the form of Miscanthus sacrifloris and the broad sugarcane-like foliage. Some varieties are better than others in their dead winter foliage. Miscanthus sinensis gracilimus in the gravel garden never looked sick of the winter the leaves with a bleached fawn that you expect, but curled wonderfully and didn't even break in the freak snow we had. Miscanthus sacrifloris, on the other hand, with much broader foliage, hang, hangs absolutely limp until the leaves blow off and accumulate in neglected corners of the garden. It's often argued this, that Miscanthus saraband, which I used extensively in my front garden, is virtually identical to Miscanthus gracilimus, so slightly earlier flowering. Whilst in climates like ours with a shortish summer, this is a great advantage as Gracilimus sometimes doesn't make it into bloom. Saraband misses something of its beauty. The, the flower heads of Gracilimus are slightly more pendulous and have a more dramatic purple sheen. The leaves of Saraband don't have the tendency to curl in the cold weather. Certainly anywhere it was sufficiently warm, I would prefer to grow Gracilimus than Saraband. New varieties of Miscanthus are still hitting the market, having been in quarantine for many years. Miscanthus flamingo was released this year with pink flowers of very open, pendulous form. Certainly there are enough varieties now to be able to choose between heights, flower colours, flowering time, pendulousness of flowers, width of leaves and autumn tones. Actually, it's quite a good picture here of my the front garden as it ended up being kind of inspired by that James Van Sweden model. So I'll give you a, I'll just give you a look at that. 
And interestingly, that was the only photo, the only bit of planting that Christopher Lloyd liked in my entire garden. Uh, he didn't like this book at all, actually. Um, he would say otherwise if he was here, but he did, didn't. Uh, but he really liked that picture. It kind of had something of a juiciness and impact, those canners there amongst all the grasses and things that, that he particularly loved, a kind of touch of the exotica. Anyway, um, oh, I haven't finished that date yet. Indeed, most varieties take on fascinating autumnal tones as the weather cools down, and a seedling I once selected from a batch in a nursery turns, somewhat briefly, rich purple and red. I've abused it so badly by moving it frequently that it has never flowered. This will be the first time it has ever been in a favourable spot for more than a season, and I'm hoping for striking purple flower heads. I like to imagine the nurseryman cursing himself for ever parting with an exceptional new variety that the rest of the world can't wait to get its hands on. 2nd of October, 1998. I thought that there might be some curiosity from passers-by when the front garden was in full bloom. I didn't expect that it would stop both foot and road traffic already. I mean, it doesn't look like anything just after planting. But the first few days, everyone slowed down to look, probably with a, what on earth is that bloke up to now? Sort of irritated curiosity. But there's something undeniably satisfying about a newly planted garden that I've never been able to explain. In some cases, it might be the pretty picture created by the fluttering of brilliantly coloured and highly reflective labels that nurseries love so much. Perhaps there's the sense of growing potential. This is diminished a little when one begins to realise that in many professionally landscaped gardens, the garden will never actually look any better than the day it was planted and that there is simply no potential. Soil preparation is usually minimal as a result of cutting a budget too fine, which isn't necessarily the landscaper's fault, for they know that the cheapest quote is almost certain to get the job. So shrubs and trees are frequently plonked into plug holes cut out of appalling subsoil and have no chance of growing, let alone enjoying themselves. And plants that are enjoying life are essential to an enjoyable garden. Up in the woodland garden, the apples are in bloom and how lovely they are. That they don't have the floral density of the flowering crabs detects very, detracts very little from their beauty. What we miss in flower count, we gain in the sense of wealth and fecundity that exudes from a fruiting tree. There's also a faint but delightful scent that I hadn't noticed wafting about, but couldn't help detecting as my face was buried in the blossom while barrowing compost around them the other day. So join me tomorrow for the next episode when the spring is really hitting hard. See you then.